Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Whoever's online, please say hello. <laughs> Hi, Amrita. Good to see you. <laughs> I sometimes wish we could, you know, see each other's faces. So like a Zoom or something, a Zoom meeting rather than this because, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad we have the live stream. I mean, the, the chat going on the side, but seeing people's faces is just is so different. So... <laughs> Well, oh, God bless you. Good to see you. <laughs> yep. Oh, man, I hear my dog barking. She's hanging out on the deck, which is right there. So I can, <laughs> I can hear her. Um, do you have a dog? Do you have pets, Amrita? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you do, huh? Oh, nice. What kind? Hi, Janet. Nice to see you. So I have a, we're talking about our pets. <laughs> um, those of you who's, who just joined us. Yeah. So I have a, I have a um, four and a half year old. Um, she is, I have to think about it because she is a mix of terrier, a bit of corgi, <laughs> chihuahua, and some other things. I don't know. I don't know. So, <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, Diane. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember, Dan, did you, did you say that you have pets? Do you have pets? Or Janet? <laughs> All right. No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so, hmm. Just got home from Spicer, okay. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you joined us. Spicer is a small town, isn't it? Like up north or somewhere? Or is it south? I don't remember. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to see you all. It really is. I was looking forward to tonight. <clears throat> all right. Spent the day weeding, huh? And you loved it. All right. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I get into, you know, like a, um, like a, a, not so much a gardening because we don't have a big garden, but yeah. I, I like uh, I like weeding too. I haven't done it in a while though, because surprisingly we haven't needed to do much weeding. But um, I do like it. <laughs> I'm glad you had a good day on Green Lake. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, who else is online? I see six people. <laughs> Who's out there? <laughs> Please say hello. All right, man, I'm feeling a little stuffy here. Maybe I should turn the fan on, I don't know. <sighs> Maybe it's the hot water that I'm drinking. <laughs> uh, I prefer drinking hot water um, 
to cold water, icy water. Uh... <laughs> that is my son, you guys. Okay, that is my son. And he's doing that on purpose, just to, just to have a little giggle, a little giggle fest. Okay, because I told him about some comments that I've been receiving. <laughs> so he's just trying to be funny. <laughs> home. Because <laughs> he's, cause he's doing this from the home phone. So the last name is uh, our, our family name, Nat, but it's Home Nat. I should just call him Home Nat from now on. I told him this. <laughs> Come on, out of here, out of here, before I uh, permanently, <laughs> before I permanently, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Um, yeah. <laughs> Let me see what else he says. Hey, stay back and do some study, dude. <laughs> All right, so, so he's one of the six. Hmm. <laughs> Block, that's right, that was the word. I, I, I blanked out. Thank you for helping me. Don't make me permanently block you, okay? <laughs> but you're welcome to stay and learn some things tonight. <laughs> all right, God bless you all. I'm uh, happy to be here, I hope you are too. Let's, um, uh, See a word of prayer. Really, uh, I think tonight is going to be wonderful. Um, it's going to be different. I know I have a good feeling about how the Lord is going to lead us because uh, tonight I was going to get into Genesis chapter four and we're going to finish that. Um, but I was going to touch on, you know, uh, particularly verse 19 and talk about Lamech. Lamech, the first the first uh, mention of polygamy in the Bible, right? And um, uh, Diane, uh, you had a question about it too, and I'm sure others also want to learn about it, what the Bible talks about it. Hi, welcome, Austin. God bless you. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that. And as I was thinking about that and praying about it, I could sense, you know, how the Holy Spirit is going to lead us. Um, and so I think tonight is going to be wonderful. And so thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus. I pray that you will lead us and guide us tonight, Holy Spirit. And we're so ready to learn and to receive from you. Whatever you want to teach us tonight, Holy Spirit, teach us. We prepare our hearts. We prepare our hearts. Thank you, Lord. We submit ourselves before you, Lord Jesus. Ready to learn and grow in our knowledge of Christ and your great love. Thank you, Jesus. I pray for anybody who's here with um, burdens in their heart, Lord. I pray that by the end of tonight, Lord, that they will be set free, Lord Jesus. Just as they grow in their knowledge of you, that they will be free, free in their minds. Thank you, Lord, from the burdens that they're carrying. I pray for my brothers and sisters on this live stream. God bless you all. God bless you all and lead you into exactly that truth that you need to be free. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you, my brother. I receive that. All right, let's talk. Let's talk about what happens in Genesis chapter four. Okay, so this part is one of those things, and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll the thing is, we're gonna be reading about uh, polygamy and similar things throughout, throughout the Old Testament. And, and, and so it's one of those things I think, you know, believers will read it and just kind of quickly just <laughs> fast forward, fast forward. I don't want to read this part because um, we just don't fully understand sometimes. Like, why? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? And, and even this question, why did God allow it? And, you know, all these questions. And as long as we don't have an understanding of these things that really bother us, um, it's going gonna, it, it's gonna to be like a, a, a stumbling block, you know, and God doesn't want us to have that, right? And it will keep you from understanding some things about God and keep you from fully understanding, you know, his, his, his goodness, his good character. Amen. And so um, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. So here, it's just uh, giving you a little context because I know we've read this chapter maybe last week, but then, you know, we were talking about so many other things. Um, so let me just read this uh, second half of this chapter and you can read along with me. So Genesis chapter 4, thank you, Lord, uh, from 16 onwards. So 
Cain went away from the presence of the Lord, and he lived in the land of Nod, wandering in exile east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And Cain built a city and named it Enoch after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mehojel, and Mehojel became the father of Medushel, and Medushel became the father of Lamech. And this is who we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, let's pause there for a second. And let me just uh, quickly just make sure, but if I remember correctly, the word Lamech, okay, the name Lamech, let's see. Um, thank you, Jesus. It means to make low, to make low, all right? And, and um, now what does to make low mean? You can think of that as being a powerful conqueror, because when, think of conquests, when, you know, a king or somebody, a ruler um, conquers something, you know, they make low, they bring that particular place low, right? So it's in that sense, all right? I hope that's, uh, that's clear. So that's Lamech. And Lamech, it says in verse 19, he took for himself two wives. Lamech took for himself two wives. Two wives, <laughs> not one. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. And interestingly, these are the two daughters, the first two daughters mentioned, right? So that's pretty interesting to me. The first daughters mentioned is Ada and Zillah, all right? And even the part where it says that Lamech took for himself two wives. He took. So, see, that goes right along with his name, right? Uh, to, to, he was a powerful conqueror, and we will see in a minute more on that. Because uh, we talked about how names are so important, right? Names are so important. We talked about the name Abel, the name Cain. And uh, we'll also get into what Seth um, means. And uh, But now we're going to focus on Lamech. So he took for himself two wives. So now if you ask me, well, why did he do that? Well, the same reason why Cain, you know, why did Cain uh, get so upset and uh, to the point where he murdered his own brother? Why? Why was this happening here? Why are we reading about this in Genesis chapter 4? Like already? Already a murder? Already polygamy? <laughs> and then we'll see in a minute. Let, let's just, uh, let's keep reading here because this is significant. Verse 20, Ada gave birth to Jabal. He became the father of those who live in tents. Mm, well, this is interesting. So now we are receiving specific detail about the people that lived in those, in the, in that time. Right? So, because all this time we knew about what Adam did, and uh, we've known uh, what um, Cain did and what Abel did, right? One was a shepherd, and uh, the other one worked the ground, just as his father did, right? But here, now Ada gave birth to Jabal, and he became the father of those who live in tents. And then if you're reading the Amplified Version, it says, nomadic herdsmen, all right? So he became the father of those who live in tents and have cattle and raise livestock. So you're getting a picture here of uh, something. This is very important. Verse 21, his brother's name was Jabal. He became the father of all those who play the lyre and flute. So they're now musicians. Hmm, interesting. So shepherds, those who work the ground, uh, nomadic herdsmen. Now we see musicians. Next, Zillah. Zillah gave birth to Tubal Cain, the smith, and that means craftsman, and teacher of every artisan in instruments of bronze and iron. Wow. <laughs> now that's one more craftsmanship, all right? One more thing added. Musicians, herdsmen, craftsmen. Wow. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. We're going to pause there for a minute. So now, what is the picture that's being created in your mind, reading about all these things, all these different interests being developed, and they're all doing different things now, okay? Very, very interesting. It's like you're, you're, you're watching a whole, um, a civilization, is that a good word? A civilization being formed here, right? 
So it's no longer just about Adam and Eve. Now we're saying they had children, the children had children. And so there are lots of people now. And they're all doing different, different things. That's interesting. All right. Let's keep going. Verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech. <laughs> oh my goodness. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. All right. For I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. It's interesting that when I, when I read this, and even the last time I read this, I read it the same way. It's like my tone just changed. <laughs> it just automatically just changed because you can just tell, even just knowing the, name, the meaning of his name and how he took for himself two wives. Like, why did he do that? How come, you know, he was the one who was like, you know what? Why should I be happy with just one? Let me also get one more. Why not? All right. Now this guy, here he is calling his wives and he is announcing this to them. Like, all right, ladies, listen up. <laughs> I have killed a man for wounding me. A boy for striking me. Are you hearing the, the arrogance, the boasting in his voice? Or is that just me? <laughs> it's definitely boasting there. And then he says, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech, 77-fold. Okay. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech will be avenged 77-fold. All right. This guy is boasting. But if you go back to the previous chapter... Just for the sake of comparison here, okay? Because um, he's even referring to Cain here. So if you go back to the, well, not the previous chapter, the same chapter, but just a couple of verses where uh, Cain is talking to God. All right? Thank you, Lord. Cain, we see that he uh, was hiding. He hid it. He hid the fact that he killed his brother, right? Because look at this. The Lord said to Cain in verse 9, where is Abel your brother? And he lied and said, I, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? So that's, very, that's a very different re, uh, response, very different reaction compared to Lamech's reaction to him killing a man for merely wounding him. This thought crossed his mind, well, he wounded me, so I'm going to kill him. I can do that. And not only that he could do it, but I can get away with it. This is justified. In fact, the reason is, well, Cain is avenged sevenfold. Surely the Lord, all right, will avenge Lamech 77-fold. So, so, so interesting. Wow. No hiding there. He's boasting about it. All right. Let me just finish reading the chapter and then we'll go back to uh, verse, verse 19 and talk about polygamy because that's a question that a lot of people have. All right, so in verse 25, it says, Adam knew Eve as his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. And named him Seth. Let me just quickly. Thank you, Lord. I'm looking up the, the name meaning, all right? It means appointed or placed. Thank you, Lord. He was born. It's interesting to know that he was born shortly after Abel's death. All right. And it's and, and you have to listen. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing us this. You have to listen for, to, to, to her, um, Eve's words here. You have to listen to even her tone and what she's saying here. Because when Seth was born, she says... God has granted another child for me in place of Abel because Cain killed him. God has granted another child for me. Which again, let's just go back several verses um, back to, where was this? Thank you, Lord. Mm -mm -mm. Where is it where it first say, it talks about, um, yes, right there. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. When she conceived and gave birth to Cain, she said, I have obtained a man with the help of the Lord. Now you can see it in two ways. All right. One way is she's saying, yes, the Lord helped me, you know, um, 
have this child without him, I wouldn't have had this child. The other way to look at it, given, you know, the character of Cain and all of that is that she actually thought, wow, me being the mother, me being Eve, right? The, man, the mother of mankind, I have given birth. I have obtained this man. The Lord only helped me. <laughs> Are you seeing it? The latter is what I... Um, um, what I'm hearing more. So now go back, contrast that to um, verse 26, where she now has, she has now conceived and given birth to Seth. And she says, God has granted, God has granted me. All right. God has granted me this child. All right. So that's beautiful. Now, to Seth also a son was born, whom he named Enosh mortal man or mankind. All right. At that same time, if you have a highlighter, you can highlight this. Verse 26. At that same time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Men began to call on the name of the Lord. Wow. That's beautiful. Seth is born, the appointed one, you know, and, and when, after Seth was born and he had his, his babies and all that, then that time the Bible is telling us, People began to call on the name of the Lord. This is the first mention of people calling on the name of the Lord. That's amazing. Thank you, Lord. So now we'll talk more about Seth and, you know, his family, his descendants and all that in uh, when we read chapter five. We may or may not get to it tonight um, because we have so much to talk about Lamech here. So I want to hear from you. Lamech, we see in his tone and the way that he's speaking to his wives even that there is no tenderness, right? There is no tenderness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Diane, can you, um, I'm just trying to understand why, why, what? Are, we, are you talking about verse 19? Like why he did that? Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Oh, or is your question um, about why men began to call on the name of the Lord? Thank you, Lord. All right, I'm, uh, let's, let's talk about Lamech. I want to hear from you all. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. Okay. So you're talking about verse 26. Yes. We'll definitely talk about that. Okay. We'll definitely talk about that. But that, but um, it's very significant, very significant. And um, in fact, let me just, let me just share this. Okay. I want to answer your question before we get it um, to the next thing. In chapter five, when you read chapter five, if you read, uh, let's see here. Um, it says here, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, right? And uh, we studied that so much, made in the likeness of God and what that means. And it says, he created them male and female and blessed them and named them mankind at the time they were created. And then verse three says, when Adam had lived a hundred and thirty years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image and named him Seth. That's beautiful, huh? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hint, hint, that's the answer right there, okay? Because when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son. That is the Seth that we're talking about. And it, the, and, and the scriptures, it's like highlighting this to us, that this, this child, this child whom the Lord blessed them with after Abel was murdered, all right? He was in his own likeness, in the likeness of his father, according to his image, and he named him Seth. And now if you, if you keep reading um, about all the descendants of Adam, and you keep reading, 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 all right? And we see in verse 19, somebody by the name Jared, all right? He lived 800 years after the birth of Enoch. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And had other sons and daughters, but then Enoch was born to Jared there. All right, Jared became the father of Enoch. And this Enoch, this Enoch, 
We read about him more in, from verses 22 onwards, but it's just a little bit. This is all we get to read about Enoch. It says, Enoch walked with God 300 years after the birth of Methuselah and had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, okay? And Enoch walked with God and he was not found among men because God took him away to be home with him. Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> And he's again mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 as well. In verse 5, Enoch walked with God because God, and then he was just taken. He was just taken. Just like that. And we'll talk more in detail about this. But we see something shifted right there, all right, after the birth of Seth. Something shifted and people began to call on the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Was it something about Seth? You know, was he, did he have that hunger in him to um, know more about this creator who created him, right? And uh, maybe he wanted to understand more about, okay, who am I really? And we were created. We were created in, in God's image, and I want to understand more about that. Maybe he was one of those, right? Anyway, we'll talk more about that. But um, let's go to verse 19, and uh, Mr. Lemek here. All right, who decided, I can have two wives. I don't want to just settle for one. So I want to hear from you all. All right, your thoughts about this, about this question. Not thoughts about what Lamech did, but your thoughts about this question. Um, is this God's idea of marriage? Because that's, it, it's very interesting to me. Over the years, I have heard from so many Christians. I've actually seen arguments about this on social media. So it's very interesting that we're talking about this today. I've seen arguments that Christians have with other Christians about this topic of polygamy. And the argument is that, is this, you know, that... Um, that God was totally okay with this. Like God permitted this and, and you know, he is saying, yeah, this is, this is great. Like you guys should definitely, you know, um, this is my idea of marriage. Like seriously, people will argue with you and say like, yep, God totally approved of this. Thank you, Lord. It's very simple. The answer is very simple because it goes back to the creation of Adam and Eve. It goes back to the creation of Adam and Eve. There's not a whole lot. I mean, why? I, it's so interesting to me that people, instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to take them, guide them into all truth that is really helpful for them, all right? Um, they're spending all of their time. This is what happens if you just read through the scriptures without the help of the Holy Spirit, all right? Then you're not receiving the truth that you actually need for life. You'll just be getting into all kinds of things that will just like, and then you'll think, oh, yeah, yeah, this is how it is. And then you'll have... Uh, vain, you know, imagination and arguments with people and that is how you will spend the rest of your Christian life. And what a waste. It's very simple. The answer is in Genesis chapter 2, the creation of man and woman. And I just love this part. <clears throat> I have this part highlighted in my Bible where, I just love this, we talked about this, remember, where um, the fact that, you know, there's this deep sleep, we talked about this so much that so I don't want to waste time, you know, talking about it again. But the deep sleep that, sleep that uh, God put him in, right? And then while he slept, he was in this deep sleep. God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her and presented her to the man. All right? This is God's idea of marriage, everybody. And then Adam looks at this woman. And remember, he was in a deep sleep. That wasn't just like, you know, anesthesia so that God can do surgery. <laughs> All right, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then Moses comes in and, uh, and he says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed or embarrassed. Uh, that, my brothers and sisters, is God's design for marriage. 
The discussion should simply end right there. <laughs> like, it, that's, that's it. Does God approve of, you know, um, uh, um, any other kind of marriages? Mm-hmm. Nope. His idea and design is right here. It is crystal clear. Crystal clear. Now, um, as I was praying about this tonight, right? I don't think God wants us to just stop right there and be like, okay, there you go. All right. So Lamech did something that he shouldn't have. Well, after all, man fell and this is now a fallen world that they're in and uh, they have free will to make whatever kind of decisions they want to make. And um, we can just end this discussion right here and that's the end of the Bible study. But then I really felt strongly, all right, that the Holy Spirit was leading me to talk about King Solomon. <laughs> and I was like, really, Lord? Because that's going to take like a whole hour. <laughs> that's going to take a whole hour. But I'm, but I'm telling you, I knew when I started this, these uh, live streams, Bible study live streams, the Lord was going to um, help everybody watching this and studying, you know, with me uh, to see the heart of God and to see Jesus in the scriptures. All right. To see Jesus Christ in the scriptures. This is so, 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 so important. And so I see where the Holy Spirit is leading us. All right. <laughs> That's right. And thank you, everybody, for your responses. No, it's not God's design for marriage. No, if that was uh, the Lord would have created more, more than one Eve for Adam. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No. Yes, that's who I thought of, Solomon. Okay, perfect. Let's talk about him. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I am so excited. I feel the Holy Spirit, man. I'm telling you. See, reading the scriptures and, re you know, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us. It should be so exciting. It should be so exciting because with everything he teaches us, whew, we just like gain understanding and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the thing. We, he will constantly show us a connection back to Jesus, connection back to Jesus. Like you will be surprised, you know, how we will read what seems like the most random thing, all right? Um, and then when the Holy Spirit shows you Jesus, even in that, you'll be like, what? <laughs> And that's why I think every night that we've had these live streams, we've shared the gospel message, right? This is the most beautiful thing. Thank you, Lord. Okay, so we're going to go. We're going to go to, let's see, Solomon, Solomon, Solomon. Where are you? Okay, let's go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, just a quick uh, little context here. So David is now nearing, you know, um, his end, basically. And uh, uh, we see in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, chapter 2, where um, as his time to die approached, he gives his son Solomon instructions because he had heard from the Lord. You see, David was, was a man who heard from the Lord, which is very significant also. And he is now giving um, instructions to Solomon based on what he had heard from God, which is which is what? That your, um, it wouldn't be your other son. I'm forgetting his name right now. It'll come to me. Was, was it, uh, oh goodness, what was his name? Adonijah? Okay. It's not him who's going to be the next king after you, but it'll be Solomon. In fact, Solomon will be the one who builds the temple for me, not you. All right. This is what God told King David. And now King David, as his time is nearing, is approaching to die. He's calling his son Solomon and he's telling him, listen, I'm going the way of all the earth, but be strong and prove yourself a man. Prove yourself a man. <laughs> oh, okay. That right there, you can highlight that. What does it mean to be a man? <laughs> all right. Verses three onwards. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. All right. Walk in his ways. Keep his statutes, his commandments, his precepts, his testimonies. Wow, this is some serious talk between father and son. As it is written in the law of Moses, so that you may succeed in everything that you do and wherever you turn. So that the Lord may fulfill his promise concerning me. <laughs> concerning me. Not just you, Solomon, but concerning me, saying... If your sons are careful regarding their way of life to walk before me in truth and with all their heart and mind 
and with all their soul. See, I would highlight that part too. Thank you, Holy Spirit. With all their heart, with all their mind, and with all their soul. Does this remind you of so many other verses? Oh, yeah. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Same thing. You shall not fail to have a man or descendant on the throne of Israel. Okay? Now, let's uh, fast forward a little bit. And um, look at verse 9. This is just before he died. Um, <clears throat> this is also very important because the father is saying to his son, but now do not let him go unpunished. He's talking about um, this other guy. What's his name? Uh, Shimei. I think that's how you say it. Shimei, Shimei. All right. This character will come up later, but anyway, we're not going to go into that right now. But he's, the father is giving him some instructions about some people. All right. That he will run into uh, when he rules. So, but now do not let him go unpunished for you are a wise man. You are a wise man, says his father. So he had this, this King Solomon, who we all know to be like the wisest, right? To ever have lived. Um, the father is saying, you are a wise man, my son. Okay. And then after that, we see, um, let's see here. David, David dies. And then I'm going to skip uh, 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 this chapter here and let's go to chapter 3. First Kings chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. Now, mm, let me read to you from verse 1. Oh, okay, yeah. Now Solomon became a son-in-law to Pharaoh king of Egypt by taking Pharaoh's daughter in marriage. He brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. But the people were still sacrificing to God on the high places. All right. For there was no house yet or temple built yet for the name of the Lord. So that is uh, Solomon's task. And so until the temple was built, these high places, you'll read about these things called high places. Okay. That is where... Um, they would go and offer sacrifices to God. But also, that was also the same place where, if I'm not wrong, where the, the pagan worshipers, right, um, they would go and also offer sacrifices to their idols, all right? So there is a, understand that there is a great need for this temple to be built. And King Solomon is tasked with that, okay? So now, uh, verse three. Now Solomon loved the Lord, Okay? Solomon loved the Lord, walking at first in the statutes of David, his father, <laughs> except for the fact that he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. Now, why is that uh, sounding like it's a problem? It's because um, when you read in, I think it is, um, I don't know exactly, I think it is somewhere in Le Leviticus. Somewhere in Leviticus, in, in the Amplified, it should tell you, uh, Leviticus 17. So you can read this later. Leviticus 17, 3 and 4. Actually, it talks about um, the law. It required all sacrifices to be offered at the tabernacle. Okay? So that is why. But here we see these people, and including Solomon, he loved the Lord. And he was walking in the statutes of David his father, but they were all offering sacrifices at these worship sites, these high places. All right? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're gonna be, we're gonna find out. We're gonna find out. All right. So now I'm going to fast forward a little bit more because you see, there's a lot to talk about. I'm just highlighting a couple of uh, very important scriptures here, following the journey of King Solomon. So now, thank you, Lord. In verse five, it says, "In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night." And God said, ask me what I shall give you. Okay. And then Solomon said, you have shown your servant, David, my father, great loving kindness because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and with uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept 
for him this great did I repeat that? And you have kept for him this great loving kindness in that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. All right. So now he's understanding. All right. And I see what, what I, what, what you want me to do here. And so now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. And as for me, I am but a little boy, meaning that he knows, he understands that he has uh, maturing to do. Okay. He needs more uh, not just experience, but also wisdom so that he knows how to build this temple and, um, uh, lead all these people. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is among your people whom you have chosen a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding mind. This is the important part. Give your servant an understanding mind and a hearing heart with which to judge your people so that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge and rule this great people of yours? So he, he clearly he knows, oh, I, I, I have a big task ahead of me. All right. And I simply, the way that I am right now, I cannot do it. There's no way I can do it. So Lord, give me a hearing heart and an understanding mind. This is what he, he asked for. A hearing heart. Thank you, Lord, and an understanding mind. Now, it says in verse 10, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And so God said to him, because you have asked this and you have not even asked for wealth or long life or the life of your enemies, you asked me for understanding. Therefore, all right, I've given you a wise and discerning heart so that no one before you was your equal, nor shall anyone equal to you arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked. <laughs> so he also receives wealth and honor or the, uh, let me put it this way, the wisdom to know how to um, build things and to grow in wealth, right? And honor would be added because later, if you read, if you read Proverbs, which is also written by um, a huge, uh, most of it was written by um, King Solomon also, the book of Proverbs. In that you see time and time again, where he talks about exactly this. He says, wisdom, wisdom will promote you right? Wisdom will ensure that you grow in all of these things that we're just reading right now. Amen. And then, and then here's a key verse, verse 14. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David did, then I will lengthen your days once again. So not only did his father tell him, listen, you need to walk in his ways. You need to obey God and keep his commandments, all right? The father told him, and now we see God himself telling him the same thing, all right? And soon after that, we see him. He is wisely judging people, like this is good. And he is growing, like his power, wealth, wisdom, everything, we see it growing. Even in verse, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 29, you, you see, um, it says, now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind, meaning a heart or a mind to understand things, right? Like the sand of the seashore. Wow. Verse 30, Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than all men. Okay. This is all good news, right? This is, this is amazing. He is the wisest and he's, wow. Wow. I'm skipping so much of what exactly he was doing with that wisdom. You can read this on your own. And then chapter six talks about the building of the temple. All right, here we go. Um, thank you, Lord. And in this chapter, verse chapter six, and if you read verse 11, from 11, it says, now the word of the Lord came to Solomon. So once again, Previously, we saw the, he saw the dream, right? And then we see uh, the word of the Lord came to him at Gibeon. And God gave him some instructions there. And um, same thing, follow my commandments, right? And here we see in verse 12, concerning this house which you are building, Solomon. I think this is a, such a crucial time for God to speak to him. And he has the listening ears for that right? He has the listening ears. 
That is very, very crucial because that is honestly, that is what he asked God for. Are we understanding this? That's what he asked God for. Lord, give me understanding. What is he saying? Give me a listening heart because he knows like that is how I can grow. That is not any different for us, for, you, for me and you, my brothers and sisters. And while he is building this temple, right? The most important task. We, you know, like it's, this is the Lord's temple. Now com comes God and he's, he's talking to him again. So this is very significant. Verse 12, concerning this house that you're building right now, Solomon, I have something to say to you about that, is what God's saying. If you will walk in my statutes and execute my precepts and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will carry out my word or promises with you, which I made to David, your father. Wow. Time and time again, you'll see this being repeated, you know. The promise that I kept with your father, David. The promise that I kept with your father, David. Do you see the Lord honoring his father, David? A man after God's own heart. Honoring him even after his death. Reminding his son, listen, I want to keep this promise. I will keep this promise that I made to your father, David. And he's reminding him, walk in my statutes. So Solomon built the temple, all right, and he finished it. Now, I'm going to skip a couple more verses here, actually several verses, and we're going to go to, um, thank you, Lord. Let's go to chapter 8, chapter 8. The temple is built, all right, and now we're going to talk about the ark being brought into the temple. Is everybody here? Everybody good? Before I move forward... Please give me a thumbs up or something if uh, you're okay with this pace. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and when he had said this, he breathed. I'm just reading the, the comments here. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. What's a parable without truth? Unruled people have been going through the book and plucking out the misinterpretation and sowing in the... Spirit of truth, the tears are the misinterpretations. The voice makes my life worth living. Continue listening to the Holy Spirit as you read the scriptures. Thank you, Lord. All right, I'm seeing a thumbs up. Awesome, I'm gonna keep going. So now the temple is built. The temple is built. Now, King Solomon assembles all the elders, all the people, everybody's now showing up. This is a grand occasion. Just imagine this. Wow. <laughs> Just imagine this day. The day has arrived. And now the, he's now telling them, bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is in Zion, which is Zion. He's telling them it's time to bring the Ark of the Covenant, all right, to the temple because the temple is now done. It's finished. And so they brought up the Ark of the Lord and the Tent of Meeting and all the holy utensils, everything. Everything is now being brought here. The priests and the Levites are bringing them. Okay? And now, stay with me here. This is all significant. Verse 6. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the house, into the Holy of Holies, under the wings of the cherubim. Wow. Skip a couple of verses here. And let's go to verse 10. It says, Now it happened. Thank you, Lord. Now it happened that when the priests had come out of the holy place, the cloud filled the Lord's house. The cloud filled the Lord's house. So the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory and brilliance of the Lord had filled the Lord's temple. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Why did God ask them to build this temple? Why was it so important for the people? And look at what happens when the Ark of the Covenant was brought and placed in the Holy of Holies. Thank you, Jesus. God's presence, His glory, and the brilliance of the Lord filled the temple. Thank you, Jesus. 
And after this, after this, Solomon says the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness of the cloud. I have certainly built you a lofty house, a place for you to dwell in forever. And then he turns around to the people and he blessed them. And he blesses the name of the Lord. And he's just, you know, his mouth is just so filled with praises at this point. You can read this whole thing. It's such a blessing. Just, just read this whole, whole chapter. All right. And he says, now the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke to my father, David. Thank you, Lord. He's a God of his promises. Amen. And so you can see him. You can just hear it in his voice. You can hear his voice here as you read these verses. And you can see just how important this was and how um, amazing it is. And what a, what a, what a, how, I don't even have the right word to describe this moment. <laughs> what they were witnessing. The presence of the Lord had filled the temple. And then he dedicates, right, the temple. Because in verse 23, you see him saying, Oh Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below who keeps the covenant and shows loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept what you promised your servant, my father, David. Thank you, Lord. You have spoken with your mouth and have fulfilled your word with your hand as it is this day. Thank you, Lord. And he says, graciously consider the prayer of your servant and his supplication. And then, you know, and he prays. He prays for people. So now he is, he is not just king. He is in this uh, position of priest, you know. And he's praying now. He's praying to God. He's praying for the people. This is very powerful. And um, let's go to verse 61, which I think is such a key verse here. Verse 61 says, therefore, your hearts are to be Wholly devoted. This is Solomon speaking. He's saying, he's saying to the people, your hearts are to be holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Devoted to the Lord, our God. To walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as today. Wholly devoted to the Lord, our God. This is what his father told him. This is what God himself told him. This is what he's been doing this, thus far. And he's now telling people, guys, the presence of God is right here in this temple. Now we must be wholly devoted to him. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. And then the end of the chapter, it says, uh, on the eighth day, he sent the people away and they blessed the king. Then they went to their tents, joyful and in good spirits because of all the goodness which the Lord had shown to David, his servant, and Israel, his people. So these people are now so full. They're feeling so joyful. They are joyful and they're in good spirits. So when they're returning to their homes, understand, you know, this, this state of their minds, you know, and their hearts. Like, what, what, what were they thinking? What was their experience like being there? Thank you, Jesus. Now, it happened. This is the next chapter. When Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house. So he also built a, a palace for himself after this. And all else which he was pleased to do. That the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time. Just as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. Hmm. And now God is now talking to him in response to all the prayers that he just prayed at the temple. And he's saying, I have heard your prayer and supplication. All right. I have built, you know, I have consecrated this house, which you have built by putting my name and my presence there forever. My eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Wow. As for you, here we go again. If you walk before me as David, your father walked. Thank you, Jesus. As David, your father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness, acting in accordance with everything that I have commanded you and will keep my statutes and my precepts. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. Just as I promised your father, David, saying, you shall not be without a man or a descendant on the throne of Israel. And he says, if you or your sons turn away from following me, all right, 
but do you go and serve other gods and worship them? Then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and I will cast out of my sight the house which I have consecrated for my name and presence. Thank you, Lord. Now, <clears throat> after this, we read about uh, King Solomon and more of all the, the wealth and everything that he had uh, um, that he had amassed. And in chapter 10, we see the Queen of Sheba visiting him. Why? And it says that people were coming from all over the place to hear his wisdom, you know? And so here comes this queen, and she also wants to know. She was very curious, like, does he really know a lot? And she spoke with him about everything, it says in 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse, um, uh, verse 2. She spoke with him about everything that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king, which he did not explain to her. Now, when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon and the house which he had built, and she uh, saw the food on his table, she saw the seating of the servants, she saw the attendance of his waiters and their attire. You need to keep in mind, look at the things that she is paying attention to here. His cupbearers his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord. She was breathless and awed. Breathless and awed by the wonder of it all. So it wasn't just his words, but it was all the things that he had um, accomplished and gained. She's looking at all these things going, in fact, she couldn't even say anything. She was just breathless and in awe. And then she told the king, the report which I heard in my own land about your words and wisdom is true. I did not believe it until I came and saw it with my own eyes. Thank you, Lord. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. You exceed it all. How blessed are you men? How blessed are these your servants who stand continually before you hearing your wisdom? She's saying. And then she says, Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Now, you know what this reminds me of? <laughs> it reminds me of something that um, I've talked about on this channel before, you know, because... Uh, when the Lord spoke to me about this, I was like, oh my goodness, I get it. Because for all of us teachers of uh, the scriptures and those of us who call you know, them, uh, themselves prophets and apostles and all of that, everybody, in fact, all, every minister of the gospel, all right, you and I both, everybody, all of us here included, when we have to realize something that when we go out and, 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 and do something or say something to people, that ultimately... The goal is not that they hear us. The goal is not that they will hear me, me and what I know and, and how good I am and how blessed I am and how anointed I am. Me, Reshma. All right? Yes, they will hear what I'm doing and what I'm saying. They will, they will see it all. But the goal is that the way that I talk and the way that I live my life and represent Jesus, they should, just as Queen Sheba does here, they should be giving glory to God. They should be blessing God. This is, this, is, this is really, really awesome. How blessed are you? How blessed are your men? How blessed everything? But then she says, Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne. The one who made you king. Blessed be him. <laughs> I pray that that is exactly what people would say about you and I both. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The glory is his. Amen. Now, now if you keep reading... The, it says in verse 14, thank you, Jesus. The weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. And then it just goes into all these things that he had with him. My goodness. My goodness. Okay. And all the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which, which God had put in his mind. Now, now we're going to get into the part where some things happen and it's seven o'clock <laughs> and it's seven o'clock how did time go so fast no all right everybody just stay on please just give me a little bit more time here i want to finish this now 
in chapter 11, it says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Now, earlier we read that he took the, the Pharaoh's daughter as his wife, right? But now we see, now he loved many foreign women. Mm. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite women. From the very nations of whom the Lord said to the Israelites, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you. For the result will be that they will turn away your hearts to follow their gods. Yet Solomon clung to these in love. If you want to learn more about that, that particular law, it's written in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 17. Specifically speaking to the kings, that is what um, is being written here. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away from God. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. And his heart was not completely devoted to the Lord his God, and as was the heart of his father David. Do you see why I went through all these other chapters? Because earlier we saw him saying, guys, this is after the temple was built. And the presence of the Lord filled the temple and he said to the people, we have to be wholly devoted to God. And here we see he was not, he himself was not wholly devoted to God. He had all these wives and concubines and all these um, princesses and, and they turned his heart away from God. His devotion, he was not wholly devoted to God anymore. And in fact, <laughs> he went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. And, and you can read in the next couple of verses there in that uh, chapter, so many other detestable idols. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. It says it there clearly in verse 6. Solomon did evil things in the sight of the Lord and did not follow the Lord fully as his father David had done. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So the Lord became angry, it says, with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. That was verse 9. And he had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not follow other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Before, Because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. But look at this next verse. Look at the heart of God here. Remember, we are not just reading through these scriptures just to know the stories. We're reading to understand the heart of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He says, however, I will not do it in your lifetime. Why? For the sake of your father, David, for the sake of your father, David, I will not do this in your lifetime, even though he disobeyed. Oh, my goodness. The long suffering of God. It is one of the most remarkable things to me. Like, I just cannot. I can't fathom that. I don't think I can. But when you read through scriptures, you know, you can, but it's like, that's why it breaks my heart when people keep talking about, oh my goodness, the God of the Old Testament was so mean. Have you read the scriptures? How can you say that? If you've read the scriptures, if you read your Bible and you read it with the help of the Holy Spirit, you will see the mercy of God, the long suffering of God and how much he honors people who, whose heart was, was turned towards him. He says here, for the sake of your father, David, I will not do this, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son, who is Rehoboam. You can read about that in uh, later chapters. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom. I will give one tribe, which is Judah, to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Wow. 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 And so there's a key thing, you know, in this, I, I missed that scripture, but it says that Solomon and all the people of Israel, they, they were in this, you know, time of peace. 
They were enjoying peace during the time. But after this disobedience to God, you know, God, there was a season where God raised adversaries. There were enemies that arose. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Let me see how much more the Lord wants me to keep going or not. Because I want to talk about the thing that is probably, that the, probably you are asking, how can a man who is full of wisdom like this, like King Solomon was, how could he have done all these things? How could his heart have turned away from God? You're probably saying, well, isn't that what wisdom should have done? Like it should have protected him from, from you know, going astray. Anybody here asking those questions? Let me know in the chat below. Thank you, Lord. Meanwhile, let me see if he's highlighting any other scriptures to me here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'm going to, yes, I'm going to stop there. But you can read. You can read about exactly what happens. Um, thank you, Jesus. And you can see what happens. It's exactly, Rehoboam goes one way. And then this guy, um, I think his name is uh, Jeroboam. He becomes king. And you see what happens to him too. He also turns away from the Lord. And so it just doesn't end well. Thank you, Lord. Now, I think it's uh, really important to um, think about this. And this is what, uh, this is how I want to end tonight's um, live stream, because it's going to bless you. Uh, let me read to you this one verse, okay? James 1.15. I, I uh, love this scripture. James 1.15. And I may have uh, brought this up when we did, when we talked about sin. It says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay? That's what we see happening here. Now the question is, how did this happen, even though he had this wisdom? And I'm not seeing any um, answers in response to that in the chat. Anybody wondering that? Because that's what I want to talk about, wisdom. What is that? What does it look like for us today? Because Proverbs, <laughs> written by King Solomon, he says himself in Proverbs. Yes, you're wondering. That's right. In uh, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Okay, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Remember that verse? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3 is another. Um, there's, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures, all right, that talk about wisdom for us today. Let's read Colossians 2 and 3. You know what it says? Thank you, Lord. Let me just go there real quick. In him, meaning in Christ Jesus, lay hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him. In him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen. I also want to read to you, let's see here. Um, Thank you, Jesus. I want to read to you also. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. 1 Corinthians 1 and 24. And it reads, But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. In him lay all the treasures, right, of wisdom, and knowledge and it says christ is the power of god and the wisdom of god he is the power of god and the wisdom of god let me also read to you thank you jesus um another key verse to know first corinthians chapter 1 30 to 31 it is because of him 
that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Mm, so Christ, he became to us wisdom and in him are hidden all the knowledge and all the power, all the understanding. Okay, we're not done here. Please stay with me here for a few more minutes so I can finish this topic about this wisdom. I know in the future we'll talk more about it, but I know somebody's, somebody needs to hear this. Look at this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you as well. Thank you, Jesus. In him, you see, the Bible also talks about that there was a mystery, all right? That there is a mystery, and that mystery is not revealed to us. That mystery is Christ. No, no, why? And so this brother, you know, on the chat, he was talking a lot about uh, parables and stuff. I mentioned that actually in one of the live streams, why Christ himself talked in parables to some people and um, spoke directly to others. Okay, I'm not going to go into that right now. But um, what is, I want to ask you all this. What is the purpose of wisdom? You heard King Solomon's story. You heard that for us today, Christ is wisdom unto us. All right. There is no greater mystery. That mystery has already been revealed to us. It is Christ. He is the power of God. He is the wisdom of God. So what is the purpose of wisdom for you today? You know what else comes to mind? Isaiah chapter, I think it's 60, where it says, uh, Arise, shine, for your light has come. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But while I'm looking for this, I want you to write in, in chat. If Jesus has become unto you wisdom, that is really important for you to know. What is the purpose of wisdom today then? What is the purpose of wisdom? Thank you, Jesus. Arise, shine, be radiant with his glory and brilliance of the Lord for your light has come and the glory and brilliance of the Lord has risen upon you, has risen upon you. And you know, it reminds me of, of King Solomon's experience at first when he was wholly devoted to God. He was wholly devoted to God. And what happened? People would come because his light, his light had, um, he was, he was shining. He was shining. All right. And the glory and the brilliance of the Lord had, you can say that it had risen upon him and people came to see him shine. Right. <clears throat> but when he was not wholly devoted to God, what happened? We read what happened. There are all these other distractions. So having a listening ear, you know how that his, the story of King Solomon starts with him asking, Lord, please give me a, a, a year, a heart to hear your voice. And so for you and I today, understand this, my brothers and sisters. Ask the Lord, Lord, give me listening ears, a heart to be wholly devoted to you, Lord. Do you see why I talked, I spent like a whole live stream just talking about brokenness? A couple of days ago, I talked about brokenness. Lord, break me. Let the Lord break you in a good way. Amen. Not let the way that the world breaks you. But Lord, break me. Why? Because we need to wholeheartedly love our God and serve him. So what is the purpose of wisdom? Can I tell you what the purpose of wisdom? In my understanding, and this, in, this is what it is. It is to know our God. First and foremost, and the, the greatest reason is this, to know him. To know him. There is nothing beyond that. that, is, that that's nothing greater than him. He has become unto us wisdom. Why does Apostle Paul keep talking about, Lord, everything else is garbage. I just want to grow in my knowledge of you. I need to get to know you more and more and more and more. And then when you are wholly devoted to him like that, and now you open your mouth to speak, when you open your mouth to speak, out comes wisdom. Meaning that you are revealing Christ to the people who are listening to you. 
It's a lot more than, oh, I know about Isaiah, I know about this book in the Bible, I know about that book in the Bible. You see, this is exactly why when you don't understand that Christ has become unto you wisdom. And this life that we live is to know Him. It is to know Him that is wisdom. Do you understand? If you miss that, you will think, oh, I know all this about Bible history and theology and all this kind of stuff. And you will have arguments with people and you will come away feeling like, oh, I'm so good. But that's not wisdom. Let me also say this. And this is where King Solomon missed it. He started like this, but he missed it. Wisdom is also knowing what he is saying to you right now. It is, what is he saying now? What is he saying now? So it comes back to this relationship with him. Everything comes back to the same thing, my brothers and sisters, communion with him. What is he saying to me right now? I'm not just living off of something he told me 100 years ago, but really, I know I hear his voice. I hear his voice. That's how King Solomon started that journey. Lord, I must hear you. I must know. I must know all these things. Only you can teach me. Do you see? It's no different for us. Lord, I must hear. Give me, Lord, spiritual eyes, ears to understand spiritual things. <laughs> I know. I know I hear from him. He tells me these things. And I'm going to just follow him. Follow the sound of my shepherd. Do you see? That's wisdom. That's wisdom. So I'll just, I'll just end with this. Oh my goodness, I wish I had another hour. Maybe we'll finish this tomorrow for sure because I don't want to keep you all too long away from other things that you have and your families and I myself have to go back and be with my family too. Proverbs, the book of Proverbs was written by the same person that we're talking about here. All right? But I believe that it was written in the early years of his life. All right? When he was walking with the Lord. Another book that he has written is the book of Ecclesiastes. A lot of people love the book of Ecclesiastes. I like the book of Ecclesiastes. It's not my favorite. <laughs> but, hey, I still read it. It's in the scriptures, and it's important for us to read it. Okay? And there's so many things which um, the Holy Spirit has shed light on. And he will when we talk about more tomorrow. We're going to go into the book of Ecclesiastes and contrast that to Proverbs and what really happened to this man who was full of wisdom. And how this is so relevant and applicable for us. Oh my goodness. It is so, 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 so important. Because think about this. Mary at the feet of Jesus. Does she not have a, a heart to, to hear his voice? And that is exactly the, the thing that Jesus said. No, Martha. Martha, remember what your sister did. It is the one most important thing. Your sister chose the right thing, Martha. And I will, that will not be taken away from her, Martha. Hear the voice of Jesus. That's what he's saying to you right now too. Sitting at the feet of Jesus with a listening ear and you grow in wisdom. That is the most important thing. That is the most important thing. When you read Ecclesiastes, however, you're reading what the same King Solomon wrote in his latter years. And the tone changes and what he's saying in Ecclesiastes versus what he's saying in Proverbs is so different. We'll talk more about it tomorrow. I think it's a good place to stop. God bless you all. Please let me know. Please let me know um, if this is helpful for you. And if you have any other questions, post it in the comments. I always read them and I will uh, respond. Okay? Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, everybody. Be rooted. Be rooted. It's all about this whole being wholly devoted to our Lord. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'll read the comments a little bit. I know some of them are just weren't exactly on topic. That's why I didn't quite go over them. God bless you all. I still appreciate all the comments. <laughs> Don't stop commenting. Um, thank you so much. I love you all. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.